now I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Leadership and Development, Providing Outstanding Customer Service. I'm going to hand things over to our featured presenter. He is Executive Leadership Coach and Professional Development Consultant, Mr. Brian Ackles. Brian, you now have the floor. Thank you very much, Kelly, and uh, and thank you very much to everybody who's uh, who's listening to this. This is uh, uh, this is a topic which is near and very dear to my heart because customer service affects everything that we do, uh, whether it's in our personal lives or in our professional lives. Uh, customer service touches us every time we we interact with another person and this this is this is really really a key understanding when we think about customer service is that every single interaction we have with people really is about customer service so what is customer service so simply put it's providing what a customer expects in a way that adds value to their relationship and enhances the perception and image of the service provider yourselves and the organization that you represent. So it's giving the customer what they need at the same time making your relationship and your organization shine in their eyes is a different way of putting it. As I said when I started talking about this, we need to see everybody as our customer. And customer service isn't just about the transaction. Uh, if you think about going to a grocery store, you, you go up to a checkout counter and you, the, the, the person swiping your groceries through and scanning your groceries and bagging them for you, they're not just carrying out a transaction, they're providing you a service. When you're dealing with a person in your office, uh, an admin assistant, they're providing you service and you're providing them information and you're providing them a service as well. What we're trying to do with providing outstanding customer service is ingrain this in our, in our way of thinking and in our way of working with everybody. And we need to help customers in any way that we can. And we need to help primarily by building really effective working relationships with them. Now that doesn't mean that you know you're you're with every customer you're trying to build a long-term relationship. But even a relationship which lasts 5 minutes, which is a good relationship, right? That generates repeat business and that generates increased customer satisfaction, makes your job easier, makes your life makes you feel better actually as a person as well. The bottom line is outstanding customer service is about attitudes and actions. It's how we see people, it's how we treat people, and it's how we follow through with people. And it's, it's something which is very genuine in the way that we deal with people. So who are our customers? So traditionally we think of our customers as those people that we provide goods and services to outside of our organization. And though, you know, these are the external customers. You know, we all have people that we provide something to. We're, we're in business, we do something. Um, my customer base is, uh, in, is the public safety community in, in Western Canada. Um, I also deal with, with other customers across North America and, and around the world in, in terms of leadership and development. I have customers everywhere. Internal People inside your organization are also your customers. You s serve people inside your organization. You provide information to them, you provide uh, outputs to them, you provide reports to them, you provide tools to them. Um, my boss is my customer at work. I provide a report to him every week and I need to make sure that I understand what information he needs so that I can tailor the report appropriately. He, you know, he, he gets a lot of information from a lot of different areas within the organization. So I need to make sure that he has the information he needs for what I'm responsible for and what my teams are doing. It's the same way as, you know, people in finance uh, are, are, you know, are they my customer? Well, yes, they are because I'm providing them information to help me with procurements. Am I their customer? Absolutely. Uh, you know, they're providing me the services uh, to make sure that the financial transactions that I'm dealing with, both from my own from my own personal 
you know, getting paid perspective, uh, but also the way that we're treating um, the other parts of the organization, the procurement policies that we deal with, et cetera. Uh, it's the same within a communications group. Uh, our communications function, you know, they look outside, I provide them information as well. So, I mean, I'm providing a service to them. Uh, they're asking something from me. So again, so we have this customer relationship. And if you look at, critically look at your own organizations, you can find these internal customers very, very easily in everything that you do. And it comes back to treat every person you deal with as a customer. So customer service providers, and, and we, we've already touched on this, every job in every organization has a purpose. And, very few organizations employ people that have no purpose for being there. I know we've seen Office Space and movies like that, but you know, the reality is, is everybody has a job and they're at a company for a particular reason. And every purpose serves a customer, whether it's a directly, directly services an external customer, indirectly services an external customer, or directly services an internal customer or indirectly services an internal customer. The thing is, everybody interacts and makes a difference to somebody else in the organization, no matter what their job is. And there is no role in an organization that does not impact somebody else in the organization. And that's a crucial understanding when you're thinking about providing outstanding customer service is to recognize that within your own organization is a good place to start. If you're providing excellent customer service and outstanding customer service inside your own organization, and if you don't really deal with external customers, that's fine. But if you're making people's lives better, those people that do deal with external customers, then you are indirectly providing outstanding customer service to an external customer. Everything fits together and everything is generated in an organization to an end goal and end result, which is providing excellent and outstanding customer service. Everything we do, every way that we do it, matters in terms of how our customers feel about us. And it's very, very important if you think about repeat business, about your customer, about your organization's reputation, um, and in this day and age of social media, our reputation is, is only, you know, it's, it's damaged by one tweet. Uh, so it's critically important. We're, we're conscious of this, of these attitudes all the time. Think about when you're meeting people for the first time, particularly if you're dealing with, uh, with external customers. And it applies equally well to internal as well. But think about first impressions. How do you feel when somebody greets you with a smile, with a warm greeting? How does that make you feel? It should make you feel, it probably makes you feel good. I mean, I know it, it certainly makes me feel very good when I'm meeting somebody for the first time and I'm, I'm, I'm whether it's uh, as a professional business relationship or whether it's just, a, whether it's in a retail environment, it doesn't matter. If somebody greets me with a smile and a warm greeting, a sincere greeting, that really makes my day. It really makes me feel a lot better about doing the thing that I'm doing or meeting with the people that I'm meeting with. Being positive and friendly shows that you value the person that you're talking to. You value your customer. Being courteous and respectful. This is important for all customers. Common courtesy and, and, and just and pure, simple respect. Everybody needs something everybody wants something and everybody wants to be treated and feel that they're being treated a little bit specially and positive welcomes really create emotions positive powerful emotions and these emotions really lead to more loyal customers how likely how likely are you to go back to an establishment and we'll, we'll simplify this to a retail establishment or a restaurant where you have been provided outstanding customer service from the time you well this just from the time you walk into a store to buy something and from the time you leave you have been treated in a way which you feel respected which has provided added value to you um, you got a fair price uh, you found what you needed how likely are you to go back 
to that establishment or record or recommend that establishment to somebody else very likely and that this is what all the research shows this this type of emotive connection that you get from outstanding customer service generates repeat business working with customers internal and external you need to stay positive and being positive can be hard. There are days when we just don't feel as positive as we might other days. Some people struggle with this more than others. However, there's an interesting feedback here, and it's a, and it's a really powerful feedback loop. If we work at being positive, that decision to act positive actually helps our thoughts become positive which then makes it easier for us to be positive. So it's, it's, a, it's a really, and it's, a, it's kind of a play on words, is it's a positive feedback loop. And the, the same thing is true in, in, you know, if, you're, if you're being negative. You, know, you get the whole thing, if you're negative, other people will be negative and, and, and it reverses. So it does work both ways. In any situation that you're in, you can look for some positives. There's usually something. And it may be a bit of a stretch to find something but there is some positive. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a very simple example. Uh, I, about two years ago, I was trying to get internet service uh, to my residents, and I had a choice of two different providers. One was the local cable provider, and one was uh, one of the local telephone companies. So I called the cable provider, and I previously had service with them. I know that I knew that they had service available to, to where I live, and I took three weeks back and forth with their customer service department uh, and they, where they finally said, we cannot give you residential service. We can only provide you business service. It's going to cost you twice as much, um, but that's all that we can do. Now, it was not what I wanted. And I said, you know, I said, no, absolutely not. But what was really interesting was that this person that I was dealing with, their customer service person that I was dealing with, actually suggested to me that I should call the local telephone company because they were more likely to be able to provide me the service that I wanted. So this person knew that they could not do what they needed to do for me as a company. But they went and told me that in order to satisfy my need, I should go somewhere else. Now, that's kind of an extreme example of customer service, but I'll remember that company and I'll remember my interactions with them. And I deal with them on a professional basis all the time. And I like dealing with them because that type of customer service attitude pervades the organization. It didn't turn me off that I couldn't get my internet service from. Them. It was disappointing, certainly, um, but it was you know, very gratifying that they suggested a solution for me. So a positive in that situation was, you know, I didn't get what I wanted, but at the end of the day, I got a good recommendation and I still deal with this company because of the way that they dealt with me. So all of this, all of this as we talk about customer service and outstanding customer service, is we need to understand what our customers value. And this is a deeper question than it seems on the, on the surface. So you, you ask a couple of questions, you know, what do customers want? What do your customers want and what do they need? And the interesting thing about these two questions is that they may lead to different answers. They may want something, but they only want it because they think that's what they need. So really, in, in your interactions with your customers, you're trying to delve down to find out what their actual need is so that you can satisfy that and have that conversation with them and then provide them with what they need and potentially what they want as well. I mean, the, the two can often go hand in hand. But you need to understand your customers. You need to know your customers. You need to engage with them. So you have to spend time learning about what your customers need and what they actually do want as well. And it's, it, it is a time consuming thing, particularly in a, in a business environment. If you're in a retail environment, it's, it's a lot different. People will come up to you and say, I'm looking for a part for 
my dishwasher or I'm looking for uh, sheets for my bed or I'm looking for this type of, uh, of, of, of meat or, or this type of breakfast cereal. And you can point them very directly to what they want. Now, you're not going to engage in a conversation with them about breakfast cereal to say, well, is that what you really need to have? Do you really need breakfast cereal? Or do you think that you might need some type of different breakfast food? You're not likely to do that. But you are providing them with information to get them to where they need to go so they can move, get, get what they want, get it efficiently, and move on to what the next thing that they need to do. Right? So again, providing customer service, understanding what they want, simply asking how can I help you is a fantastic way to greet a customer when they come into your establishment. How can I help you? So simply ask them. Understanding the customer's situation. So they said, you know, most customer needs are fairly self-explanatory. You know, if you're if someone's in the market for a, for a vehicle, they're going to buy a vehicle. If someone's uh, looking to you to provide them services, and if it's off-the-shelf services that you provide, then it's 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 understanding you know the the scope and breadth of the services that they want. If they're engaging with you to develop something bespoke and something unique for them, then it's a different type of conversation and you're trying to delve down to what their actual needs are. But we need to allow the customers to communicate what their needs are rather than telling them what they need. Now, having a conversation with them and asking exploratory questions and 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 under you know trying to gain that understanding is not telling them it, it's engaging in a dialogue and it's engaging to find out what they want what they need you know some customers will have a lot of questions because they don't they, they know they need to fix a problem but they don't know how to fix it so you're asking probing questions and you're asking directed questions to say you know what is a particular issue? What is the challenge? What are you trying to accomplish? What is your need? What is what is the problem you're trying to solve? And, and you start to peel back the layers of the onion to identify those needs. And over time, we learn about different customers and we learn about different needs that they may have. So sometimes that level of experience helps us make quicker decisions to satisfy customers in, in a different manner, but that's more likely to happen in a uh, in an environment where you're providing uh, sales of off-the-shelf products, which is fine. I mean, and again, as you gain experience with this, you'll be you're able to read people better and better to say, you know, I'm I'm pretty sure I have exactly what you're looking for. It's over here. Come with me. I'll show it to you. Or uh, yes, I can get that to I can get that for you absolutely, and you know it will be uh, delivered here, delivered then, delivered when, whatever it doesn't matter. But you can make these estimations. If you're working primarily in, with customers and clients on larger, longer-term projects, you know your experience with the customer will allow you to make better decisions as you move through those longer-term projects. So all of these scenarios and situations work in sort of the more they're more commodity based relationships or the more longer term relationships with customers it's all just a matter of scale but the bottom line is you need to understand the customer situation no matter how short the interaction you have with your customer it is an understanding of their situation which will help you provide that outstanding customer service so try to avoid assuming or prejudging what people want. You know, making an assessment too quickly, um, it's, this is something which we all can do, um, and it can appear, appear a bit patronizing, which is something we really don't want to be seen as if we're trying to provide this level of outstanding customer service. Listening, checking for understanding, um, we this, this helps us avoid prejudging and it also engages with the customer because you're asking a question you're, you're making sure that you understand now again you don't want to be trivial about this as as, as uh, yeah, really trivial about it either it's important that you're asking questions to confirm understanding not to sound like you're trying to get the customer to tell you something which they've already told you so again engaging professionally engaging positively with your customer. Let the customer guide the conversation. 
you're pausing, you're listening, and you're asking questions for clarification and understanding. As you ask these questions, you're able to, you know, dig in a little bit further and find out a bit more about what they're looking for. It also helps build rapport and demonstrate respect that you have for your customer and your clients because you're asking them questions about their situations. You're interested, genuinely interested in what their problem is that you're trying to help them resolve. And again, that's building the context and building respect with your customer. So, how do you meet the basic needs of your customers? How do you how do you make sure that you do this the right way? Being friendly, a warm greeting. Right? Customers should always feel welcome. The, the, you, a customer should never feel or be made to feel that they're intruding on you during your work day. So if you answer the phone and someone says, is this a good time to talk? I said, absolutely. Because if you've answered the phone, you've already made the commitment to talk to somebody. So your response in that situation shouldn't be, well, actually, I haven't got a lot of time right now. Can you call me back or can I call you back? You see, that's not really, that, that's setting the stage that they've intruded on you. So if, you've answered, if you do answer the phone, you're making a decision to talk to somebody. Be understanding and have empathy. Customers need you to understand that they're having a particular challenge or that they need your help with something. And you're not judging, you're not criticizing where they are, how they got to the point that they're in. What you're trying to do is to provide a service, to provide a potential solution to the situation that they're in. You need to be fair with your customers. Everybody wants to be treated fairly. If people feel that they're being treated unfairly, they're going to get upset and they're going to get defensive. And we'll talk near the end of this webinar about, you know, dealing with angry people. But just be fair with people and you can help de-escalate this before it even starts. Customers generally feel like they want to be in control. They, they know what they want and you cannot tell them differently. They know exactly what they want, even when they haven't got a clue what they want. Uh, but they need to feel that they're in control. So, so you can suggest things to customers. Don't tell them things, but suggest things to them and let them make the decision. Provide them with options and alternatives. Provide them with information. You know, you're knowledgeable about the things that you do and the things that your company offers to your clients and your customers, internal or external. You, you have that knowledge. Share that knowledge. Share that information with people. That way, your customers are more informed about your products and services. The more informed they are, the more likely they are to provide you with the information you need to help them as well. We often hear people talk in situations with customers about the need to exceed expectations. What does that actually mean? How do you exceed someone's expectations? Excuse me. It, it's not always possible, but what is possible is to come at every situation involving a customer with an attitude and a mindset that you want to exceed their expectations. Now, the reality is, of course, some people have unreasonably high expectations and there's no way you're going to exceed them, but you don't think that way. You think that, yes, I'm going to exceed everybody's expectations. And it doesn't really take very much to exceed somebody's expectations. And it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not the big win. It's not the big kill, if you will. It's just something really small. It's the follow-up. It's talking to somebody. It's getting to know them a little bit, depending on the situation. But it's the small things to help your customers feel that they're being respected that they're being treated well, that they have your undivided attention when they're talking to you. So that they see that you respect them and that they see that you're genuinely interested in helping them resolve the problem that they have come to you with. All customers have a problem. 
they're looking for something, they don't know what they want. Uh, it might even be that they just don't know where it is, but they have a problem and you're there to help them find the solution in the best possible way that they can. If you get, if you have a chance to get to know your customers over a longer term, you know, remember something about them. Remember, you know, remember, make a note about the last time they called. All of our call handling systems now, you know, they all have notes about customers. And so if a customer calls in and said, I'm calling about account, account number 35737764, you know, you're, they're busy typing away, bringing up that, bringing up that person's records. And the person answering the call, the call handler is saying, Ah uh, yes, uh, yes, Mr. Ackles. Yes, I see that you uh, you 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 talked to us about a month ago about uh, that situation with your internet, uh, for example. And uh, did you get that resolved to your satisfaction? They're asking something that's about remembering me as a person. If you promise to follow up with them, or if you simply do follow up with a customer when they've had a problem that you've helped them resolve, pick up the phone and call them. Send them an email if it's more appropriate. Find a way to contact and follow up with them. I take my car into a dealership to get it serviced. There are lots of great mechanics around, but the dealer is close to my work. Um, they do a great job. I take it in there twice a year. They do the service for me. It's fantastic. It might cost me a little bit more, but the customer service I get from this company is absolutely outstanding. When I book the appointment, they tell me, yeah, you can drop the car off. When do you want it back? Do you want to wait, et cetera? They ask me all the right questions and they ask every single time. They don't assume that I'm going to do it the same way every time. When I get my car back, it's clean. It's been cleaned inside and out. They explain all the repairs to me. If there's any, any maintenance that they expect me to have to do at the next interval, they tell me about it so I can plan for it. The next day or at most two days later, I get a phone call from the dealership saying, just following up on your, on your latest service, how was it? Did, you know, was there any issues, were there any challenges? And, and every single time they do it. And maybe once every year, or once every couple of years, they'll ask me if I wouldn't mind filling in a survey for um, the manufacturer about the service that I had from their dealership. And I'm grateful to do it, and I'm very happy to do it. But that's the level of follow-up. And those little things, that's providing outstanding customer service to me. And there's nothing much. They're little, small things. And it makes a big difference to how I view them as an organization. Little things, exceeding expectations. It all helps generate return business. The more positive perceptions we create, the more loyalty we create with our customers. We treat them with respect. We engage with them as people, as human beings that have an issue. We understand their needs and we're meeting their needs and we're trying to exceed their expectations in any way that is memorable. The biggest thing in business is to keep your customers that you've got while winning new ones. If you lose a customer, it's more it's, it's expensive to get new customers. It costs generally about five times more to attract a new customer than it does to keep an existing one. Think about that, five times more to attract a new customer. So, outstanding customer service is not just a good human thing to be doing and a nice thing to be doing. This is based in good, solid business sense. What we're trying to do is to make sure that we have return customers, that we're developing a relationship with people, that they want to come back and they want to work with us again. Because for the most part, our customers have options. They can go somewhere else for products and services. They may not want to, but if they're not being treated well, they may feel that they're being forced to. So again, that little bit extra, that, that mindset of exceeding expectations, that true engagement with your customers, thinking that not so much that they're always right, because the customer often isn't always right, but what the customer is always is they always have a problem that they're coming to you to help them solve. And if you understand that and if you delve into it, you will win customers. You will continue to retain your customers. 
So again, good solid business sense around this. Now we interact with customers face to face and we interact with customers by phone and by email. Now there is a whole study um, about how well we interact with people and face to face in person interactions are obviously the best way to build rapport with customers. However, we do not live in a day and age where we can spend our time going out and meeting every single customer every time we have a question or an interaction with them. A lot of times we're dealing with people solely by phone and solely by email. Um, and it's not as easy to interact with people on the phone. You have to work at it and you have to work at creating the right impression with people when you move away from face to face because you're losing the rich richness of the face to face communication context. So when you're connecting by phone, you're very much dependent on the pitch, the pace, the tone of your voice, and the choice of words that you're using with people. I'll be honest with you, it's no different than what's happening right now when you're listening to me. I could talk in a very flat, non pitched tone of voice, and I could go through this, and I could use the same words that I've been using. But it really wouldn't be very entertaining and very informative for you, and it wouldn't be very engaging for you, because I can't emphasize enough how you have to engage with people. We need to focus on people. We need to focus on their drives and their desires. We need to be successful. We need to focus on the relationship we have with them as much as we need to focus on providing them with that service or providing them with that product that is gonna be the end result of this interaction. So you have to work at it harder. You need to choose your words quite carefully and avoid speaking too quickly. A lot of people lose the plot. They, they don't understand when, when you speak too fast. So slow it down, ask lots of questions, clarify for understanding. Um, if you have to plan further meetings, you know, set the time for it, et cetera. But again, you're dealing with somebody over the phone and you've only got your voice to do it with. They can't see you. But one of the things that they can do over the phone is they can hear whether you have a smile on your face. And that's a, that's, it's really interesting. You can pretty much tell if somebody's grumpy on the other end of a phone line with you. Whether they're saying the nice words or not, if they're not, if they don't have a smile on their face and they're not positive and they're not being positive, then the words don't match the tone. There's something wrong. It's, it's kind of like verbal body language. So when you're talking to people, when you're talking to your customers and clients on the phone, be positive, have a positive attitude and have a smile. People can hear a smile, it's a weird thing to say. So you need that extra effort. Um, don't take long silences. Um, if you're working with customers and you're working with them to bring them through a process, make sure they understand at each step of the way what part of the process they're in, what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what's going to happen next. And if you can't resolve a particular issue while you've got them on the phone with you and you have to schedule a callback, schedule it to their convenience and make certain that you follow through with what you promised to do. Because again, you're simply a voice on the phone. They can't see you, they don't see you, they don't know you as a person, they can't tell from your body language that you truly empathize with their situation and that you will follow up and that they can trust you. You need to earn that trust and it's a lot more difficult if you're just dealing over the phone with people. But you earn that trust and you show respect by following up on your commitments. So again, you need to work at this a little bit harder over the phone, but it can be equally as effective. Now we come to the evils of email. And, and I choose those words pretty carefully because electronically, uh, we're connecting more and more with people via email. I receive a tremendous amount of unsolicited sales emails uh, as a result of, of the professional position that I have as part of my life right now. 
they are annoying to the extreme because I would say 95% of them are poorly worded. 95% of them try to make an emotive pitch in the first couple of lines. Every single one of them is addressed to me in a role that I don't even have in the organization. They're making an assumption that I deal with a particular part of the organization that I don't deal with. So reaching out to somebody via email is something, if you're cold calling to create customers, I, I don't feel that it's as effective as it could be. You need to be also very careful of your written words when you're working with people and you're working with emails because language can be interpreted very differently by different people. So you need to be very professional and you need to avoid using um, short forms, uh, acronyms, et cetera, things that are colloquial to your, to your area of the world. So this is the idea of netiquette. Avoid ats or hashtags in your written communications. In business communications, it's really not appropriate. You're really trying to take as much care communicating over the net and through social media, through email, etc., as you would on face-to-face -face or on the phone. Uh, I don't know how many of you would actually spend time talking to a business colleague going, hashtag funny. Uh, if you're in dealing with a customer face to face, you're probably not speaking that way. You might be, but you're probably not. It depends on the environment. It depends on the, on the type of business you're in as well, I suppose. But again, if you're dealing with clients and you're dealing with customers and you're building long-term relationships, it's a very professional type of communication. It's very clear. Don't pretty it up. Don't flower it up. You know, be clear, concise, and professional in your language, uh, in all your interactions, and particularly when you're online email, Twitter, text messaging, um, whatever you're into. Again, keep it professional and avoid uh, the colloquial terms. Understand, and again, understand in a global environment where you're maybe dealing with a lot of people who's, where English is not their first language or uh, whatever language you're working in is not that your customer's first language, that you need to be very precise and clear in what you're communicating. So again, netiquette. Choose your words carefully. Again, email, again, lowest, it's the lowest bandwidth communication. It's very hard to express meaning and intent. Therefore, you're really keeping it very factual and very, very clear. You want to avoid ambiguity. You want to avoid misinterpretation. Um, we've all heard the stories. We've all seen the things coming over Facebook and through other social media about misinterpreted communications. Be clear be genuine, and be unambiguous. And again, follow up. If you're into an email exchange with somebody and that you, you've resolved it, you, you've provided them the information they wanted via email, for instance, as an example, make sure that you follow up with them to, make, to, to see that what you have provided is actually what they need. And it's, it is actually solving their issues and solving their problem. And again, we come back to the idea of follow-up. Follow-up is about customer retention. Follow-up is about creating new business from your referrals. If you have, if a person has a really positive interaction with you as an organization, with you as a person, and they're talking to their colleagues and they're at an industry function and they're networking with other people and they're going to mention you. They're going to mention your organization and that's going to generate business. And it works. You're creating that positive relationship and it's about following up, following up and following up. You will get complaints. No question. Every, every organization, every person that deals with customers and deals with customer service gets complaints. There are things that you can assume that all customers have the following rights. To be treated with respect, to be taken seriously, to be listened to, and to receive a quick response. If you give your customers these four rights, then you can help address the complaint that they have. And it can also help to de-escalate an angry situation. 
at some point we are going to be confronted with an angry customer. It happens. Not everybody is going to be enthused and enthralled with our outstanding customer service. Somebody is going to have a problem somewhere. Something is going to go wrong in the supply chain. Whatever, it, whatever the cause of it doesn't matter. You need to have some knowledge about the techniques and the confidence to deal with the situation so that you can respond productively. We need to help our customers and we need to avoid getting drawn into the escalated emotion. An angry customer will not become rational until their feelings have truly been acknowledged. You need to be calm, you need to be objective, you need to truly listen and acknowledge how they feel. And this will help de-escalate and it will help the customer calm down validating their emotions, saying, I understand, I absolutely understand why you're angry with this situation. And provide an example as to why you understand that. Just saying those words generally, it will help, but if you can also show why you understand that it makes them angry, that helps them let go a little bit. They see that you're engaged and that you are truly acknowledging how they feel. It helps to calm people down. It helps to de-escalate anger. Focus on possibilities. Angry customers will often make unreasonable requests, and other customers will often make unreasonable requests or impossible requests as well. And there's a thing about a customer being told no. If you tell a customer, I cannot do that, or we cannot do that, we cannot do what you're asking us to do. It's a no, right? If you're saying no, then that sets up an interaction where they're asking for something, you're saying no, they're insisting you're saying no. But what you can do is you can flip the script and you word your responses to tell your customers what can be done. You don't focus on what can't be done, you focus on what you can do, what alternatives you can come up with what you can do rather than what you can't do. Empower the customer by asking them questions. Will this work? Is this all right? Will this satisfy your need? Will this help resolve your problem, help resolve your issue? Ask them questions. Again, focus on the what if, focus on what you can do rather than what you can't do. Simply saying, no, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. No, we can't do that. No, we can't do that is not listening and engaging with your customers. Now, there's going to be times when you just simply cannot satisfy your customers, and that's fine. Like the example I gave, trying to get internet from this cable provider, they could not satisfy me. But that's okay. I still left with a positive impression. But it was about the customer service and the language of what the person I was dealing with and how they kept calm and how they empathized with my anger because I was angry about this as it, as it moved forward but they focus on what they could do, um, and at the end, what I could do to satisfy my own problem. So it still builds good customer relationships. So you manage your own, manage your own emotions. Step back, remain objective, stay calm. You need to stay calm, confident, and professional. And focus your attention on what needs to be achieved with this customer at this particular time. Your total focus is only on that customer. So it's managing your emotions is a skill that you can learn how to do. Know that you may have to escalate. Um, there are times when customers call in and they're angry and they start threatening and intimidating you and they're uh, being very abusive. Uh, and this is where we have, particularly if you're working in a call center environment, why there are supervisors there and there are points of escalation for you to use. Refer that person to a senior, senior member of your staff. That simple thing can often de-escalate a problem. But if also know that you do not have to put up with abuse and vulgar language and intimidation from your customers. There are other remedies which if things get bad enough, 
you know, we could get into, but we'll, we'll uh, in the interest of time, I won't dive down that rabbit hole too far. Just suffice it to say that supervisors are there and senior management is there to provide support in situations like this. Now, hopefully we don't have to deal with them. Um, if you're not working in a call center environment, uh, but if you're working in a retail environment or a point of sale environment, then you're, you could still be subject to this as well. And again, this is what other staff is there to support you with. Get, get managers involved, get supervisors involved in these situations. So fundamentally, what we're trying to do is create a memorable customer experience. We need to meet the needs of the customer. We need to go the extra mile. We need to exceed their expectations. Giving them more than they expect keeps them coming back. And when our intention is always to give more than what customers expect, if it's, our, if it's the way that we think, we will always deliver that awesome or outstanding customer service that stands out. And it gets remembered for all the right reasons because we have exceeded expectations. They remember us. They know that we have all gone the extra mile to help them, to do what we can for them at that particular time. It's creating a memorable customer experience, a very positive memorable customer experience. So this is what we've been talking about for the last 50 minutes or so. It's about outstanding customer service. Right? It's about, you need to be personally effective at it, be positive in your interactions, create that positive feedback loop. Um, you need to try and, and have an, uh, an, an exceed your customer's expectations mindset. If you're always going in to an interaction with a customer, internal or external, trying to think that you can exceed their expectations, you will at some point exceed their expectations. Maybe not every time, but you, you have that attitude. Your customers become loyal when you treat them with respect, when you provide that outstanding level of service, they become your repeat customers. And then she focuses back on the internal side. If you're dealing with people and you're providing outstanding customer service to your internal customers you're treating with them treating them with respect you're exceeding their expectations that can only lead to two things one it's going to lead to great interpersonal relationships where you work and it's going to further your career in one way or another so with that i will say thank you very much uh, and uh, i hope you've enjoyed our, our talk on outstanding customer service Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you everyone for joining us today for today's webinar. If you guys have any questions on the topic, we're going to remain on the line for the next few minutes. Um, feel free to type those into the questions option and I'll go ahead and ask those uh, to Brian as well. But while I have everyone, I um, also want to make sure you guys know that we have our Center for Leadership and Development under our New Horizons brand, and there you can find the full class on providing outstanding customer service. Um, on our website at newhorizons.com. Just click on the Center for Leadership and Development and you'll see all of our upcoming courses there. It is a two-day class. Um, I believe the next one is running sometime in August. So if you would like to get on that schedule, um, just visit our website at newhorizons.com or contact your local New Horizons for further information. If you are not familiar with who your local New Horizons is, you can also log on to our website on newhorizons.com and do a zip code search to find the center nearest you. Also, a reminder that today's session is being recorded. You will receive that recording link tomorrow morning um, so that you can review anything and you can feel free to pass that link on to anyone who may have missed today's session. All right, Brian, we do have a couple questions coming through. Uh, one of them is, what are some of the common myths that are told regarding providing outstanding customer service? Common myths about providing outstanding customer service. Um, I think one of the, well, the first one that popped into my mind is that you need to give away something to your customer to provide outstanding customer service, that you have to give them something for nothing. Um, and that's absolutely not true. Um, you need to provide your customers with respect and you need to provide them with the service. You don't need to give them freebies. Um, that, that would be the first one. Um, another common myth about providing outstanding customer service. Uh, I, that, that's a little bit tougher. One of the things that does come to mind, though, is that there is an expectation that you need to always say that the customer is right. And saying that the customer is right all the time is, is absolutely fundamentally wrong. 
um, because customers aren't always right. Customers often don't know what they want. Um, but when a customer tells you, well, I'm the customer, I'm always right, then you're also, then you're immediately dealing with an angry customer and you need to de-escalate that and find out what they're actually trying to get. Um, so that's, that's a couple of common myths. All right, and when you're working with someone who you know is not providing uh, outstanding customer service um, on calls or in person, how would you approach that person um, to you know, guide them and redirect them? So if I'm the, if I understand the question, I'll, I'm assuming that the question is if I'm if I'm a customer and I'm I'm dealing with someone who's providing me customer service and it's not it's not going the way that I want. Um, personally, I would coach them on it over the phone because uh, I'm that kind of person. Uh, I, I would actually express to them, you know, I, I would appreciate a, a different level of customer service from you. I, I would I would hope that you would uh, to try and understand a bit more about what I'm trying to to get you to understand. Um, I, I don't think that you're really paying attention to what I'm trying to, what I'm asking you for here. Uh, and if they get angry with you, then you've obviously touched a nerve with them. And then you should ask them to speak to one of their supervisors, or speak to speak to a supervisor, or speak to a manager. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't slag that person off to their manager. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't complain about them. But I would explain that. Uh, I'm not getting what I want out of the organization when I when I get on to a supervisor, and I would again I would have to I would want to remain as calm as I can, uh, and as be as professional as I can as a customer to try and um, as a customer de-escalate the situation, which is kind of a reverse a reverse way of thinking about all of this. But I suppose everything that we've talked about in outstanding customer service, you can apply to being a customer as well. If you provide that level of, of calmness and professionalism, uh, then it can help other people. But if at the end of the day, if someone isn't providing the service I want, I will tell them they're not providing the service. I will do it professionally. I will do it courteously. I will do it with respect. Uh, and if they don't respond to it and I still need something from that organization, I will escalate to somebody else in that organization um, to get what I need. All right, great advice. Well, that will wrap up today's session. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Brian, thank you so much for joining us and speaking on behalf of New Horizons. Always a pleasure, Kelly. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you'll join us for future webinars. We have a full schedule up on our website, and you can register for any of our upcoming sessions or view past webinar recordings. Thank you so much, everyone. You may now log off. Have a great day.